some biscuits as well if you're in our box. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. <laughs> We had it so I think that's almost sorted, isn't it? That's Chris, he just said. Yeah, that's fine. 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 Um, probably it's very old photographs. Yes, yeah, so it won't be that. Okay, everybody. Uh, thank you very much all for coming. This is well, tonight. We're launching the Joy of Ron, which is our latest publication by the Flux Gallery Press, and this will be Ron will be available to sign afterwards. But we're going to kick off now in a few minutes. And Ron has something in mind for the first half, which he's kept secret, but I assume it'll be entertaining. And he's going to change costume and persona and do a, a poetry reading at the second half. So um, I'd just like to say a few words about Ron. I first heard about Ron when, um, from my, friend, my good friend Morris, who was for years telling us about this wonderful local comic poet. And I've always had a prejudice against uh, comedy and poetry, mixing them, being a bit of a purist. And so over the years, I just thought, nah, I can't, you know, this stand-up poetry lack is just not my scene. So Morris was very persistent about this. And uh, about a year ago, he read that uh, Johnny's reading, I think, or Johnny's party. And I suddenly thought, there's something in there. Yeah, I like that. There's something quirky, but there's also something melancholic. And, he sort of won me over slowly from being initially very sceptical. And then one day I went to visit Morris, as I do every Thursday night, and he said I bought a new painting. Nice, look, a new painting. That's interesting. So, anyway, he showed me this painting, which he placed, you know, strategically above the door where no one could see it. But I thought, he said, what do you think of that? I paid 100 quid or 150 quid. So I thought, hmm. I'm not sure about that, Morris, I said. <laughs> so I thought, I let, so every Thursday I passed it and I looked at it. And again, a bit like his poetry, it slowly, sl slowly grew on me. So that's all I'm going to say. We eventually invited him to, um, to submit some poetry and we've made a, a publication called The Joy of Ron, which is on sale tonight and Ron will be available to sign them for 6 95 So with further, without further ado, Ron, you can I'm yeah, gonna, in the CDs. In the CDs. I'll go have Oh CDs. Yeah. Well you can do your own sales pitch later. <laughs> I'm well, sure you're good enough for that. Is this too dark for you? No, it's fine. Okay. Well done. Has everybody got a place to sit? Or there's a couple of little stools down here if you want to be right in the front. You're all right there, that's okay. Just don't knock the tripod, whatever you do. Right, um, I haven't kind of scripted this, so, um, this is where it sort of all started. This is where I used to live on Beldon Moor. And um, it was in this cottage here that I sort of uh, grew up till I was about five. And that's where um, I did my first painting that won a prize, which was, en it was entered for a, a painting competition for the under fives for Robin comic. And uh, I won a prize, I can't remember what it was. But that was the first time I kind of became aware that um, my art might be interesting. Um, oh, it's gone off. Uh, I've not used this before, so I'm just... Most of the, we had uh, earth toilets there, it used to go and spring... Use it like an outside toilet, but with no water. You just sprinkle some sort of sand on on whatever you did, and the council came once a week and emptied it with a horse and cart, I think. And then um, we had um, to get water from a nearby stream with a bucket, and we used candles, no electricity, 
But my dad did eventually wire the house up and then got the uh, electricity board to connect us up. Um, and the house is still there. Um, we just sort of paid £80,000 or £100,000 for it and built a conservatory on it. And uh, my dad once left some metal there and was very upset when um, it disappeared. And some gypsies have sort of been staying nearby and they'd nick this bit of metal. And he says, you can't trust them, you know. And I said, well, you know, years later he was still angry about it. So if you left it outside the wall, maybe they thought it was okay to take it. But for him, he wouldn't take anything uh, like that. So he, he was a bit offended. Which just goes to show them we haven't got all, all got the same values. And um, I was in that garden there, under that tree, where uh, I was pointing at something and, and a bird dropping landed on the end of my finger. <laughs> and I thought that was quite a special moment. <laughs> Um, this is a car that my dad managed to buy and maintain. He worked in a garage so he could get a cheap car in the 50s and 40s and do them up. And um, he built that caravan as well. He built that, um, finished it off near the house, kept it outside the house on the lane. And that's what we used for our holidays. And um, the other thing he made was this periscope thing so you could see through the back of the car. Mirror periscope, then through the caravan to see what was out around the back. <laughs> and a piece of timber with two car wing mirrors on it, um, so we could see what's coming behind. And um, eventually he sold it and built a folding caravan. So he was pretty creative. Um, and I took that as normal, you know, that people sort of made things. Come in. Hi. Move on to the next one. But in those days, lots of stuff was homemade. People didn't buy new things. And that's the rest of the hamlet where the house was. And uh, this is a friend of my dad's who was learning to do watercolour painting. And this is what the working class used to do before television and Emmerdale would be out there sketching and doing watercolours. Seems strange now. That was considered a good, uh, positive thing to do. And we had bonfires there once a year. Everybody got around and shared the bonfire and brought the worst furniture out and burned it. But it's all got pulled down because the council couldn't be bothered emptying the toilets once a week. Most of it got pulled down. And this is my dad. He taught himself photography. There's quite a few people did in those days, in the olden days. It's quite acceptable. People had developing tanks and things and dark rooms in the bathrooms. And we used to block our bathroom window off and so he could do his photographs. And that's his wedding. Uh, he's looking very pleased, but it um, <laughs> didn't turn out the way we expected. And this is the rest of the wedding scene. And um, the woman my father married, my mother, was actually... Um, an Irish emigrant, staunch Catholic family from uh, Southern Ireland. Um, and what they didn't tell him was she was a schizophrenic. They didn't know what was wrong with her, they just knew something was wrong with her. And they found out sort of after the marriage got going that um, she, she wasn't, uh, she was mentally ill. But that's in, um, I think that's in my dad's mother's sitting room. I'm just having a, a wedding tea. Uh, there's the cake. It's all very low key. Nobody had any money in those days. A few uncles and her relatives turning up. And his mother in the middle near the back there looking pretty cheesed off. She knew something was up. And this is my dad's prized possession, um, a Hillman Minx. You don't get them like that anymore. And that's me in the back there. And that's my sister. And we went to visit my cool uh, bird who lived in Bailden, uh, but he wasn't in. And my dad used to correspond, he was greatly into uh, self improvement, and he used to correspond with this chap in uh, what was called the Gold Coast, it's called Ghana now. I've forgotten his name, but he came over on a surprise visit, and our house was already. Crowded. 
there wasn't really room for him to come and stay. He stopped for a couple of weeks. I think my dad slept on the sofa. And um, that's me in the middle there. Uh, very pleased to have that visit. And um, I think he became a, a lawyer or a barrister in Ghana. And we got still got the odd letter from him, but we're not in contact now. He's probably died. I think that's Shipley Glen. And this is us in the garden. We moved up to a council estate in Bailden. Uh, that's me in the middle. It's my sister Mary, my older brother Jim. And that was our garden. And there's some... Uh, oh, they're gone now. Some cloches. My dad used to grow plants as well. And that's come up again for some reason. But I'm pretty sure we're not going backwards. There's a bit of a rush putting all this together yesterday. And that's me. <laughs> Dragooned into taking a family, being in a family photograph, crying and picking my nose, which I still do. And that, that was my best clothes at the time. And I just... But in that photograph, uh, I've been pressing the wrong button, that's it. The, um, in that previous photograph by the caravan, there's a black patch. And that's where my mother scratched the photograph out because part of her schizophrenia was that people were after her and she didn't want any photographs of her in existence. Um, she used to talk to herself all day, scream and shout. She didn't do any cleaning or cooking or anything. We had to all that. And um, she used to write letters to the President of the United States and then throw them on the fire. And that was her way of communicating with the President of the United States. And then, a few times she just disappeared and went off um, to these kind of imaginary meetings that she was going to have people that she'd sorted out telepathically. And um, it wasn't until the 80s when they invented a treatment for schizophrenia. I was 30 odd by then. That's when she started to sort of uh, start behaving normally. But if she stopped taking the medication, she'd get into trouble. And um, you know, we'd have to try and sort everything out. Um, so I never really had a, a proper ordinary mum, but I'm sure that she did love us and she was fine once she got on the medication. Um, but living on the moors, I grew up with a deep love of the, the moorland uh, landscape. This is me near the top of Wernside. Um, got all the gear on. You do need it if it starts raining and snowing and things up there. It gets quite dangerous. And um, And the next photograph is uh, Bronwyn, who's been doing all sorts of things on my behalf. Um, people, she had this kind of new headscarf thing on, and people regarded her quite strangely on the walk. They thought that she was a Muslim, I think. And um, so that was an entertaining afternoon. And this is uh, an interesting wall. You can photograph all sorts of bizarre things up there. And the ground falls away under the moors with underground streams and things and forms potholes and chambers and passages. And this is where the walls collapsed into this little groove. And uh, it formed this nice, quite a nice like, sort of wave type. Uh, lots of things to photograph up there. And this next one is something else, nice <coughs> rocky landscape. This is on just on the edge of Addington Moor, a place called Nabend. It's on a walk from uh, Skipton to Ilkley. And this is um, a bit of sedimentary rock, I think, on Ilkley Moor. It's got a name, I can't remember it. And it's one reason, rocks like this, one reason why people thought Ilkley Moor was a sacred place. Uh, 3000 BC. This is a, a li lichen pattern on a rock. These are usually hundreds of years old. It depends on the uh, species. And I started doing a, a collection of photographs of lost objects. I thought we could start a lost property office, the discarded bottles. 
And um, what have we got here? Yeah, some kids recognised that straight away. They knew what that was. I don't know, it's McDonald's or something. But it's just things that people throw out of car windows and seem to imagine that they just dematerialise. But some things do dematerialise. That's uh, a dead rabbit. I was going to do a kind of monthly calendar of different bits of road killing. <laughs> but I wasn't sure how well it would go down. And uh, this is a sheep. Um, it's had its eyes pecked out, that's why there's blood on its head, and its two babies are sort of sat next to it. And it's pretty lethal out there if you uh, can't look after yourself. That's a dead weasel or a stoat. I think it's stoats that have black tips to their tails. Um, and this is the first of the artworks. This has quite an interesting history to it. I made it out of some old floorboards, that's the frame. And um, this is the top off an ice cream carton. And that's just a picture of someone shampooing their hair from a magazine. <coughs> These are two bits of envelopes. That's a homage to Kurt Schwitters who made artworks out of envelopes. And this is um, part of a box of matches. So that's a sort of sexual get me hot type thing. Light my fire. <laughs> there it says counsellor. Because the woman in question at the time used to sort of give me advice which I've never really had. And so I did this thing in tribute to her, and the ice cream was how people can be hard and cold, or soft and sweet. And uh, there was a, a place called Wall Street Cafe, it's kind of been, uh, continues on now as the, um, the underground or something, there is a cafe down that way anyway, and uh, they had these macrame pictures and collages on the wall and stuff made out of beans and bits of pasta. And I thought my artwork's better than this, so I took a few things down, this was one of them, and they showed them to their kind of cafe committee who decided none of it was art and weren't going to exhibit it. And uh, I suppose I could have gone into the macrame and lentil collage uh, business, but it wasn't worth it really. So, you, you know, whatever kind of work you produce, you're going to get knocked back by people really, and you've got to be prepared that most people aren't going to like your work. But that doesn't mean you should stop doing it. Um, I always like arrangements of things, mantelpieces for instance, and in, underneath cupboards, underneath sinks in those little cupboards, people stack all their stuff up. And um, I did a series of collages, I'd make a shallow box and just get some found objects that I'd find off the street, glue them all in, it was something that I thought was um, interesting and that had good composition, something that I could look at again and again and still derive pleasure from it. I wasn't the first to do this, of course, but um, it's a great way to produce works of art. Uh, whatever they are, but for me it's a work of art. I wouldn't have done it any other way. And um, it should be coming up soon. This is another one. And this is another one that the cafe didn't like. Um, it's quite a romantic one for me, because this was meant to be a girlfriend of mine and uh, this has got little love hearts on it and the broom represents you know being swept women who are beautiful or you think are beautiful can sweep you off your feet and just kind of I don't know it just amaze you really but they kind of just sweep all before them really as far as I can see down history um, there's a, a female plug there and a male plug this represents the sort of arc of heaven, and this represents infinity, that's an old symbol for infinity. And if you meditate, you might see patterns like that, and this is a sort of pattern that children draw as well, in, in exercise books, it is for looping waves. Um, and they turned that one down as well, they thought it was degrading of women, didn't get the point at all. <laughs> but, you know, ask a stupid person, you get a stupid answer. But then you've no control over how people interpret your work. And this was the girlfriend that inspired it, um, called Sarah. Um, this was one of my first paintings, and it was a kind of big experiment, really. It's about six foot high, this one. And it's quite sort of, um, you know, you start off, you start doing a painting. I don't plan them. I just kind of work from it, improvise and inspiration, and just what seems right at the time. So you in and paint over bits and 
and then you have to decide when it's finished. And um, but I really didn't know what to do after I'd done this painting. I just kind of ground to a halt slightly. And um, I did one painting with a paint roller, which somebody really liked, so I gave that one away. And then I started doing lots of black and white sketches. Um, again, just starting with one, one line, and then doing the eyes in, and then drawing the head on it. And then I didn't really attempt to do any sort of tone or shading or perspective or anything like that. And I did loads and loads of these, got sketchbooks full of them. And they're all sort of subconscious self-portraits, I think. Whatever mood you're in tends to come out on the, the sketch pad, for me anyway. And um, looking a bit forlorn there. And I started to colour them in. Um, this is another one. And after you've got a few dozen or a few hundred, you start to wonder why you're doing them and where you can go from that and this, you know, this is a little bit like a sort of Hindu Sanskrit symbol for God, I think. Um, and then I got more and more into colour. You know, how can I colour these things? What colouring technique do I need to use without sort of uh, changing it and spoiling it? And I came up with this, which is, I didn't really want to do proper portraits of people with shading and everything like that. It wasn't what, what I was interested in. And um, I like the way the hair sort of takes over the half of the, the page and this pink colour, you know, and, and I start to realise that for me I'd like to blend you know, flat banks of colour like these with portraiture, but I wasn't really sure how that was going to work out. But I kept going and um, came up with uh, the next one. Does that play? I think it is, yes. Yeah, and this was started off being Selena, oh no, it was Bette Lynch. And then she disappeared off Coronation Street. I just used to painted it and then decided who it looked like and then gave it the title. And it went on to be Selena Scott. I sent it to different art competitions. And um, finally it was Madonna. And it got picked out at um, Big Art Challenge, which was uh, a competition for artists on Channel 5, I think. Partly judged by um, Brian Sewell. And I didn't like what was happening in modern English art any more than he did, but I don't think he'd seen that he would have seen this as being an improvement. Um, and I think talking about what's wrong with British art, it's a bit smaller. The conceptual challenges posed by such transfers were critically discussed by Daniel Herman through Eduardo Palazzo's, Palazzo's studio in Edinburgh. He looked at the confront, confrontation of two differently coded frameworks, the historical context of an authentic private working space and the institutional apparatus of the art museum in which the reconstructed and artificially authenticated space is imparted and planted. And there's like so much scholarship in the British art world and you just get bulletins and books that are full of this kind of language. It's very dense, nobody understands it except people who've got a PhD in it. And it just goes on and on and on and on. It's kind of like ecclesiastical. Um, it's rubbish. For me it's rubbish, you know, and nobody understands it. Art's irrelevant to most people and yet it's supposed to be coming from the sort of wellsprings of creativity that everybody somewhere inside them has. Uh, this is a, sign, a sort of a jokey picture, um, it's called the centre of the universe and I thought well if I paint that no one can say it's wrong because no one knows what it looks like and uh, I thought yeah that's where, probably what it looks like, that's the centre of the universe and then these pictures came out from uh, the Hubble telescope that were a bit like that so I've kind of been that far off. And I did it on a much cheaper budget than um, <laughs> the Americans. And um, 
I got onto something else apart from um, portraiture, and I, I wanted my pictures to, to sort of have a narrative. In the Victorian times, people did pictures of people shipwrecked on rafts and all these dramatic happenings. And I thought, well, maybe you can do a narrative in painting. It's, it's not something you see much of. And this is called Contact, or Make That Call. And it's just basic shapes drawn out and then filled in with acrylic. There's not the right number of holes on the telephone dial. Um, but this sort of represents the time that passes when you're waiting to be called by somebody else or you should sort of waiting, shall I make that call? And there's these petals here sort of denoting the passage of time and, and mortality. And um, I've sold a couple of these uh, quite cheaply. Uh, they've gone up since then. <laughs> but people do like it. But I do owe it to my customers to keep the prices going up so that a painting that they paid £90 for or £100 for now they know that I'm selling that for £300 then they think well, yeah it's an investment because that's one reason people buy art is to make money out of it and um, so I'm trying to fill that need a little bit this is another famous person portrait this was Daley Thompson <laughs> and um, Again, quite a regal looking face. I think you can convey quite a lot of emotion in these um, head and shoulders portraits. And the necks don't be the right length. The nose doesn't look like a nose. But there's something there. You can feel the sort of humanity of the people. Or people say they can. I think you can. And um, they do work as portraits. These are about sort of three foot high and two foot wide. And... Um, and I thought I'd have a go at abstracts, and it really doesn't make much difference whether you do an abstract or a portrait or a junk sculpture. Um, whatever you do will have these kind of aesthetic decisions that you make. You make a mark, and then you think, well, that needs this mark, and then you need that mark, and then oh, now you need this colour, and then you know it's all blank over there, so I'll put a mark over there. And um, this actually started off as a landscape. It had a green bottom and a blue top for the sky. And uh, I was going to do this landscape, and then I didn't want to do a landscape anymore, so I just turned it sideways and put blue bits on this side, green bits on that side, I think. Don't want much of it. And yellow. And it looks, it's a great painting. It's about a metre square. And when I finished it, I looked at it, and it reminded me of the flight of birds, the way that birds take off in a big crowd, like starlings. And suddenly the air is filled with all this motion, and um, but they're all sort of acting in unison, and all these things are going more or less the same way. So birds somehow communicate with each other what they're going to do, where they're going to go, and they all do it. But their reaction time is seven times as fast as ours, so we just like look like lumbering elephants to them. So that's the flight of birds. Um, but it's fairly chaotic, and I decided to do one that's a little bit more sort of controlled and structured and um, this looks pretty um, symmetrical but in actual fact I did one side of it orange the other side green and then did green bits on the orange side and orange bits on the green side and it looks until you really look at it as if it's just dabs of paint but in actual fact there's two halves to it and I had an idea I'd use this technique and do things like the French flag with blue, red and green and then put red bits on the blue bits and blue bits on the red bits and white bits sorry, yeah, white and, and, and perhaps with the Union Jack well, that's a bit more difficult but sort of break up these flag images into what were apparently sort of abstract uh, paintings but I started doing other things as well I started putting two people in the pictures and seeing what sort of relationships start to exist between the people and this is a kind of glum couple uh, that's up in my bedroom at the moment and this is one uh, slightly humorous one this one it went on a um, national tour this priced at 750 pounds but nobody bought it that's 750 and this one's called the judgment of paris it's loosely based on a greek myth where uh, the hero paris has to choose between um, he has to choose between about four, I think, but you know, I'm just fitting two in here. And um, I thought 
the, these contrasts were really good. The green actually blends in a lot better with the, the red, which is, is almost by that and then the different blocks of colour for the hair, the ears, no attempt really to make them look real and what it's kind of interesting but it's not earth shattering is if you cover that half up you get a sort of a, an eye and that's like a little mouth and the same on that side as well but yes here's the only one with the ears and um, so he has to pick the, the, the Greek uh, heroine as his bride and he can't choose between them and he picks um, Ariadne or somebody and Arachne gets, ch oh, he picks out Arachne and Ariadne or Hete or somebody gets cheesed off with him and so she banishes Arachne to the solar system, to the, the constellations where she became the spider constellation because Arachne was good spinning, that's why he chose uh, Arachne, and um, so she was banished to the solar system as one of the what we call cancer, and, and there she spun for eternity. But I thought the title, The Judgment of Paris, was quite good, and it's more. This one's now about three people who've been to Paris for a, a day trip. Um, she likes the shops. Um, she thinks the the metro is very good. Um, and the cafes and restaurants. Um, he likes the, the bars, but he thinks that too many people speak French. So it's a kind of comment on modern judgments. But that was the biggest one I had in. I'd never put four people in. Um, what did we go next? Well, this one was bought by a PR company in London. Uh, ridiculously please, it's, a, it's just a masterpiece really and this is called Soft Land and uh, I used to find if I was working somewhere and you're at all sort of uh, sensitive is kind of the wrong word but if you're not kind of perpetually aggressive in some workplaces people think there's something wrong with you and you get called off and people start pushing you about and trying to find out what you're made, made of and uh, you know Boys grew up in a very aggressive culture, really, from time to time. Uh, so this was soft land. <clears throat> Again, choice of colour is everything, really. You know, it doesn't need to look realistic. It's just sort of slightly following Mondrian. And um, this one hasn't quite come out. It's two friends of mine, Paul and Susie, who were both very sort of... Uh, disco, clubland, sort of wheeler-dealer type people and you can't see but his other arm disappears off there so you can't see who else he's fancying yeah, but that's a bit how people are um, you know you are all my love, I love you, you love me but you know then they're looking across at somebody else in the, in the pub and, and it's a bit like that in clubland really you can't really tell what's up and what's down but he works for BBC3 now in uh, London is a bit of a schmoozer. And uh, a friend in Chumba Wamba, you know, a bit of name drop in, he asked me to paint his daughter who was about three months old or something. So I painted her and sent him this picture. He said she doesn't look like that, she's got more hair. And um, I thought, well, that's close enough. Anyway, I tried to put some more hair on. And he said she often wears a pink <coughs> top, so can you do the pink top as well? <coughs> So I did it with a pink top on and more hair, and then um, he didn't like that either. But I just did them as computer images. I stretched, I stretched some canvas, but I never actually made the picture. But he did buy a couple of others, and some friends of his down there saw them, and they wanted this one doing of their kids, Gem and Edie, I think it's called. But I've called it Star um, Spots and Stripes, and. Um, I think the blue's a bit darker than this. And um, it's down there, I did a copy of it. So I think they bought that for £300, one like that in the corner. And uh, then some more friends of theirs asked me to do one, and I said, well, the price has gone up to 500 now. They want one of their kids, and they never got back to me. But maybe I was pushing it a bit. But I'm not bothered, you know, commissions are a bit boring, because you can't do what you want, you have to do what they want. And I was more interested in images like this one. 
And this, for me, sums up that sort of attitude that you find with people with the trolleys in the rougher supermarkets like Kirstel Morrison's. And they're kind of, you know, <laughs> F off, get out of my way. You know, and they're just barging around with their trolleys. They're going to get the, ch the crisps and they're going to get the burgers. And, you know, they've got this universal sort of attitude of, you know, just fucking get out of my way, really. And, um, and if you do bump into them and you say, oh, sorry, they don't go sorry back like they're supposed to. They just look at you and carry on with this haughty tone. It's the haughtiness, I think, that gets to me. But um, because it's quite a savage place, I just did this in black and white. And um, I couldn't fit Morrison's on the list, so I put Asda down, which is a bit unfair on Asda. <laughs> But the sort of people who their kids can be throwing stuff at you in the cafe and, and they just don't do anything about it, you're expected to put up with them. Um, this is a computer generated picture, it's very easy to do things on the computer but can you create an image that people relate to and um, it's, it's nice, you just draw a little shape with your mouse but you're doing that on the desk and then this image appears on the screen and it's sort of like drawing with a pencil through a window. You can't really see what you can't really see what you're drawing until it comes out. And um, you might be lucky, and generally I am, and uh, create these dramatic images. I think the the the, bit, the proper one of that is um, behind the screen. But I'm very pleased with that, and it, I've got it on envelopes and business cards and all sorts of things. And it's one of my favourite images. Um, I was reading some Greek commentaries on Greek philosophers and um, the Romans used to employ Greek philosophers as kind of to sort of civilise their culture a little bit and they used to have these quotes and the Romans would then be able to speak them as if they were their own and in Vino Veritas is one, it's, uh, it should really be en, but I think that's Latin for in but it's close enough at in and um, this was another accidental thing, drew it with the mouse, was quite surprised when it, it came up on screen. And the bottle, I've tidied it up a little bit, but generally that's more or less as it is. But to me this looks, this has the kind of attitude of someone who wants to get pissed. Um, you know, and they're going to empty this and all the truth and knowledge and kind of whatever wonderful things that are in there are going to fill up this. And it's like his foot and this is his belly and he's kind of... Ah, ah, and, but wine is, you know, as long as you don't have too much, it's great. And it does have a lot of truth in it. So, you know, I like this one as well. I don't know where it is. Oh, it's down there. Oh, I love it. Fantastic. And this is a controversial one. And um, I've always been interested in religion and philosophy. You know, what did people do millions of years ago? You know, the cave painting because they want to catch animals and things like that. And um, I found a little clay mosque in the dressing room once at a place I performed. And I thought, well, that's interesting because if Freud was looking at this, he'd think that the minaret was like a penis. And, you know, we know about cows being phallic symbols like E-type jaguars and things like that. And I wondered if the architecture of mosques had anything to do with creating connections with people's subconscious. Uh, but, you know, um, you've got to be careful where you, you say things like that. And the title I thought for this was um, God's Workshop. And because the, the genitals are how God makes people, um, you know, well before the end, age of steam, we've got the pistons. And then um, Muslims and people in religion generally see mosques and temples and churches as the place where. Uh, God does his work. So it's quite a sort of uh, complimentary um, picture, but most people are very squeamish and, um, what can I say, um, um, about sex, what people are like about sex. In most religions, sex isn't really, um, it's seen as something a bit animal-like that we should sort of keep under control. But, you know, we all have to go through this dark portal at some point in our lives, uh, which could represent death and um, people like to try and find some sort of philosophy that will kind of sustain them through life uh, bearing in mind that they're going to uh, turn to dust at the end of it and most people will never know they lived. Uh, it looks 
even wilder in flesh tones. And this was an attempt to do the, the sort of flag type pictures, um, divided it into four and used the four colours to sort of decorate each square. Um, it's about a metre square this one. And um, I did two just the same. They weren't exactly the same, but pretty indistinguishable. to a recording studio and, and plugged our stuff in. I think we paid for two hours. We had half an hour setting up. We played for an hour without discussing anything and then stopped and packed our gear away. Ended up with that CD uh, which became the soundtrack of an experimental film I made which again was just me walking around uh, single framing with a cine camera. Just taking one single frame at a time or just a few seconds. Of... It took ten years to make the hour long film and then, then I dubbed that onto it. We're going to show you that as a CD, DVD or something like that, but we just didn't get time to do it. Um, but the band still plays above the day, uh, above Cicini's on a Friday night. Um, I'm not, all, not usually with them. But um, I'm busy doing other things. And I think this is the, the very blurred photograph of me performing at Brudenell Road. Brudenell Social Club. I think that's the last picture. Yeah. Yeah, yes. So how do we work it now? Well, I think that's been about an hour or something, so you've been very patient. Um, I've got pictures on sale, and they're all for sale. Um, that one's still 750. These are all 300, and um, probably do these for about 60 pounds. You don't have to buy anything, I'm quite happy with them on my walls. If you uh, buy them, I have to copy them and make another one. But, they're sort of cheap. Ah, oh, the other thing, right. And there's smaller prints. Those are 20. And there's some photograph uh, prints of lathes. I used to work a lathe. I worked a lathe for five years, did an engineering apprenticeship. And here's some uh, pliers, pincers, tin snips. To me they're fantastic objects. And um, so that's why I did pictures of them. And I think, yeah we've got the cat in small as well. And these in small. These are twenty pounds, and they're ten. So you can have a look at those later if you want. Well, I think we're going to have a break now. How long is the break going to be, Dan? Um, half an hour. Half an. Fifteen minutes. Fifteen minute break, and then I'll do some poetry performance, and you'll see what that side of my artwork is like.
Okay, so help yourself to wine or pay for wine or whatever you have to do. And I'll see you in about 15 minutes. That'll be five past nine. Thank you. If anyone still stood up, wants to sit down. A couple of tuffets. Jolly good. Um, I started writing poetry about the same, well, about eight, I think, when I first had my poetry pointed out in primary school as being good and asked to read it out. And um, I gave up writing poetry because it's, well, people tend to stop writing because it looks, reads so badly, really. And um, they compare their work with other people's, people, when people do paintings, they tend to pay, compare it with you know, the great masters and feel as though their work's not, not good enough. But everybody starts off with scribbles and doodles and, and, and rubbish and bad poetry. And um, there is a lot of bad poetry about, and most of it is terrible as far as I can see. But um, I've been performing, um, started off in the Termite Club about 30 years ago. Um, and generally perform in small venues, but I've performed in Leeds Playhouse and the City Varieties and you know festivals and things. Um, and there's a collection of uh, poetry performers from me in local venues on this DVD. If anybody wants to buy one there, £10. It's two hours of uh, performance. <coughs> and um, I tried to pick a book of bad poetry, and I don't usually have any trouble, but um, all the poems in this one are quite good. But it is the sort of Ted Hughes, Sylvia Plath era, and things have moved on. But um, this is quite a bad one. It's called Man and Wife by Robert Lowell. Tamed by Milltown, we lie on mother's bed. The rising star in warm paint dyes us red. In broad daylight, her gilded bedposts shine. Abandoned, almost Dionysian. At last, the trees are green on Marlborough Street. Blossoms on our magnolias ignite. The morning, oh, sorry. Ignite them, that's what people tend to do, is they punctuate it very badly. Ignite the morning with their murderous five days white. All night I've held your hand, as if you had a fourth time faced the kingdom of the mad. And it gets sort of more and more um, difficult, really, to comprehend what the poet's on about. And um, so I try to sort of make poetry more accessible and deal with things that... Um, people can relate to without having to scratch their heads for too long. What about Bukowski? Yes, indeed. <laughs> if he was here we could have a poetry slam, but he's not. Indeed. Here I am, Ronald Arthur Dewhurst, tall and good looking. I give the girls what they want, some crisps and half a lager. <laughs> This poem's called The Journey. So friends, we are gathered here this evening for an entertaining delight. Relax, let go, and let yourself, like a leaf, a twig, or a fragment of polystyrene, be carried on the stream of life, wheresoever it goest earth. That's a joke. Down to the river of mystery, till it meets the estuary of love, Avoiding the sandbanks of despair and the effluent of apathy. Out to the wide seas of bliss, avoiding the Royal Navy firing range of experimental weapons testing to land safely on the islands of eternal happiness and merriment. <laughs> and um, I did a few performances at uh, the Courthouse Art Centre in Otley. And uh, I've been to a few exhibitions and openings in uh, the civic, in the art gallery, so I wrote this one. Art, it's a class thing. When I go to the theatre, I usually end up staring at the ceiling and wondering how the lights are fastened up and how much the seats cost. 
when I go to gallery openings, I listen to what everyone says as they drink free wine and talk about funding opportunities for community-based arts projects before they drive back to Alwoodley or Chapel Allerton. <laughs> I looked at the statues. They are very old and often damaged. I know it's true because someone said the head and shoulders sculpture was bust. The man who made it died long ago, but his work remains with us, a bit like the canal system and Blackpool Tower. And this was, uh, went on a boat journey, on a narrow boat, it's fantastic, uh, it's called Boat. On a boat, which is afloat, the doggies can't get out. The water is deep and wet, the ducks float past looking for bread as aeroplanes fly overhead. A gentle wind is blowing beneath the feet, our feet, the grass is growing fed by the corpses of the dead. <laughs> so your beautiful day is someone else's funeral. There go. I had an interesting experience reading this one on stage at the Comedy Store in Leicester Square. did an open mic spot. Um, didn't do very many. You pay about £10 to get there. £10 to get back. Make everybody laugh and have a good time. And uh, you don't even get a free drink. So I'll pack that in. <laughs> but this is called Blackhead. And I don't know if anybody remembers it, but in the 80s, you had to be very careful what you said. You couldn't say, I was in a black mood, or uh, someone there is a girl. If they were like under 20, they'd be re referred to as a woman. And people would correct you. I once got ordered out of a house for calling a 16-year-old person a girl. And I had to sit on the pavement outside till my girlfriend had finished her tea and crumpets. <laughs> And uh, this one's called Blackhead. And uh, I did this one in the comedy store. And <clears throat> um, how did it go now? Anyway, little lumpy bit on my skin, a sly dark paw, waiting, expectant, and yet unyielding. You blossom forth, give your all, and are wiped away, discarded. And somebody thought that poem referred to black people somehow. Well, quite a lot of people in the audience did. And um, I thought they were just talking about blackheads. And I said, oh, I can see one in the audience now. And it just so happened there was a black guy in the front row. And they thought I was referring to him, which I wasn't. And then I suddenly realised that because I'd said the word blackhead, they thought I was racist and that that poem was racist. And I was just completely amazed that they would think anything like this from that. And I just packed in and left the stage. And uh, I just thought they were so stupid. But that's how life goes. People, culture's often stupid, and you just have to put up with it till people find a different fashion. Um, it's called Beautiful Brenda. It's about trying your look on the opposite sex, failing, and uh, going home alone. Beautiful Brenda. I went out, I should have took a minder. She was somewhere, but I couldn't find her. Like little Jack Horner, I came out of my corner and tried to surrender to beautiful Brenda. She was warm, but I managed to offend her. I couldn't mend her, I was just a pretender. I broke my fender and damaged my bell ender. It's still a bit tender from when I tried to surrender to beautiful Brenda. <laughs> Fortunately, you don't get points for trying in the chatter world. And this is about um, people and their relationship with animals. It's called Bird Table. I put some crumbs and water out for the birds and a small keyboard for them to play tunes on with their beaks. They've got to learn there's no such thing as a free lunch. <laughs> They get very lazy if you just put food and water out every day. They think they've somehow earned it. And um, I once went to mediumship classes and trained to be a medium, and all these bizarre things happened. Uh, I got extremely ill, um, got cancer, and the bloke that was teaching me to be a medium got cancer as well, and the devil was in the room, and all this energy was spinning around, and it was quite frightening. 
but you realise that you're the only one in the room experiencing it. So it can't be very universal, it's very particular to you. But I wrote a poem about it, it's called Birthday. It was my birthday recently, I had a birthday party, people said, what's it like to be 50? I said, pretty much like being 40, but 10 years later. Someone bought me some new underpants, but they were too small. I'm a large, not a medium, but I can communicate with the spirit world. <laughs> <laughs> but they're not actually that much more interesting than people on the, in the world. This is about fame and fortune. It's uh, about Britney Spears, who's someone who lives in America and gets in the news occasionally. Britney Spears came around for a stopover. It wasn't too bad, but in the morning she was washing up the breakfast things and she threw away my second best scourer and used the best scourer to clean some porridge off the floor. So that was it. I said, right, that's it, Britney. We're worlds apart, you and I. It will never work between us. You've ruined that scourer. It can never be the best scourer again. She said, Ram, let's not end it this way. There are more important things than scourers. What about Brillo pads? Yes, you're right, I replied. Brillo pads are more important. Perhaps we can work things out after all. She said, let's go back to bed, Ron. I said, no, Brittany. I've got to put a new fuse in my angle grinder. It's Sunday. <laughs> the day all the jobs get done. And if you don't do them that day, they'll never get done. Now, when you go to the supermarket, they'll give you a plastic bag to take your stuff home in, and halfway home you tend to realise why they give them away. This is called Bus Goes Past. I had my hand out, the bus went past, I tried to hide my tears and disappointment because I was carrying some heavy shopping and the bag handles were likely to stretch and break. And they should give away rucksacks. <laughs> yeah, there was a link for something else there. I usually improvise a lot more, but um, I'm a bit hot. And then... Take your jacket off. Take your wig off. Well, <laughs> the jacket and wig are sort of in memorial for... Uh, the hippie philosophy, which I was a firm adherent of, and um, took all the drugs that were allowed, apart from heroin, and um, had a great time, but it's not quite the same as putting money by for a rainy day and uh, a deposit on the house. <laughs> and eventually you do have to grow up and start behaving like an adult. And seeing all these different visions really doesn't uh, amount to much, even though it might be quite a lot of fun. But I, did, I was God for a while, and that was quite tricky, realising what who God was and what it was like being God. And uh, I made a few miracles happen and things, but people just dismissed them as everyday events. <laughs> but I made them happen. This is a uh, bread shop. I went into a bread shop. I said, have you got any rough cobs? She said, no, but I've got some nice crusty bloomers. Ooh, are they still warm, I queried. They're hot, she replied, fresh from the bottom. Ooh, yes, I'll have a pair of those, and four French fingers if you can fit them in. She answered, that shouldn't be a problem. <laughs> but there often is a sexual undercurrent to everyday transactions. And I've always been attracted towards beautiful women, and I admired them from afar, and as close up as I could get. And uh, beautiful people are quite intriguing. Um, and I've never thought myself beautiful. Nobody ever complimented me on my good looks or any aspects of my personality or being until uh, I was about 25. Um, I was kind of ignored as a child. And I still hate being ignored, which is probably one of the reasons I'm standing here. <laughs> so this is called Beautiful People. Beautiful people sit at tables. They are slim and have money and nice clothes. They're not that bad when you get to know them. <laughs> Corn exchange. 
I went down to the coal exchange in Leeds. They said, that's no good to us. It's a Veruca. <laughs> this is a bit more poetical. Crisp packet, it's called. It's about the crisp packets that you find in your front garden. And we don't really know where they come from. But there they are. And so I wrote a poem about it. Chris Packet in my front garden. How did you get there? Are you staying long? The blades of grass caress you, but soon you may be gone. Chris Packet in my front garden. Beefy or chicken flavour. Perhaps the wind has blown you in. Or maybe it was one of the neighbours. Right, I went to a party. And um, you see the bits of food with the uh, sticks shoved through them, bits of cheese, bits of sort of uh, grapes, bits of pineapple, uh, olives, if they haven't got stolen in, for instance. And um, people do get upset about different things in life that they see as wrong. So I wrote this, uh, you know, it might be tortured donkeys or whatever, or, you know, leeches that are used in hospitals and then just thrown away. And then... Um, so this is cocktail snatch, it's for all the oppressed people in the world. Because sometimes you just have to forget about them and enjoy yourself. Little sausage on a stick, and a bit of pineapple too. How cruel we humans can be to defenseless food portions. And this is a poetry workshop type poem. Written as close as I could get to the British poetry tradition that is at the moment current. It's called the Clyde. Gazingly he watched and stared. Staringly he watched and gazed. As the boat steamed up the river, the funnels forming neat slanted silhouettes against the grey sky. The perturbed waters turbulent in turbulence, crashing against the boat front. Propellers thrashing foolishly against the poisoned waters of the Clyde. There you go. Here's one full of pathos and romance called Dirty Socks. Socks waiting to be washed. You are stiff and sweaty. It's not an easy life living wrapped around a foot. But at least there's two of you. <laughs> I've started buying my socks in threes. So that if I lose one in the laundry, I've still got a pair. And it just entails buying three pairs of socks and splitting them into two groups of three is quite simple. You just have to get three pairs all the same. But you're one step ahead of the game. <laughs> now when I grew up, the, the sort of working class were considered to be a little bit heroic. I think it was just after the Second World War and people still thought, phew, you know, thank God for those blocks what well, haven't got degrees and things like that because they can they save us from the jerrys. And it, gradually it's changed now and people become more elitist and sort of uh, hierarchical in their minds and, and look down now upon manual labourers and, and see cleaning as demeaning. And I think those jobs are fantastic. And uh, it's great fun being a dustbin man. I was chatting to a friend of mine who's a dustbin man and he really enjoyed it until he got bitten by a rat and his arm swelled up and he nearly had to have it cut off. And now he hates rats. And at the end of this you all have to shout, the dustbin men. <laughs> Because would you like to do their job? I, you'd learn a lot if you did. Wrap broken glass and crockery in newspaper so it doesn't hurt. That's pretty good. Ah, uh, yes, this is a one uh, I read a book about religious taboos and found out why pigs aren't eaten in the Middle East and um, why people don't walk under ladders and all these other superstitions. Um, you know, was the Virgin Mary a virgin and all this kind of stuff and why women who are menstruating are seen as unclean and uh, all this, loads and loads of stuff and it was very, very kind of en enlightening and most of the reasons for these taboos are economic um, rather than God saying it because the God's not really that interested he doesn't give a toss as we can see <laughs> so this is called Don't Panic it's organic and it's about people's food fads and what they imagine the values of different foods to be. And it is quite ridiculous. I bought some eggs from an Asian shop, a loaf of bread, two cans of pop. 
I would have bought more, I would have bought a burger. But a bloke in the pub last night said, meat is murder. But then I changed my mind, so I asked for bacon. The man in the shop said, we don't sell it. No offence, mate, I said, none taken. It's a grocer's shop, but run on religious lines, a bit like a church. If you're looking for bacon or sausage, you're left in the lurch. For all those things, you have to go to the other shops. It's like Hindus and beef, or Catholics and fish. If you want to get to heaven, of course, you have to eat a special dish. Because you can't get to heaven and eat what you like, so I started a new religion where we serve up bollocks, codswall up and hogwash, cooked, cooked up with pure tripe. It's low in fibre and has no minerals. Its effect on the brain is purely submin subliminal. Jan Rolipoli makes you holy. Eating a banana to get to Nirvana. Have a nice tasty apple and with the devil you can grapple. Drink lots of fluids to keep up with the druids. And don't forget, a nice fat gherkin gets your third eye working. <laughs> Um, I was interested in Dada for a while and um, coined the phrase Dada wouldn't buy me a bar house and if you read the history of Dada and the bar house you'll see why <laughs> and that uh, phrase was written I wrote it on a wall at a party near the uh, old BBC studios and then a week later or a couple of days later it was in the Guardian, somebody had seen it after I wrote it and sent it in and it got put in the Guardian, but uh, anonymous, so you know it's not anonymous now. Mm -hmm. So the Dadoists were into uh, deconstructing things, breaking down meaning, and they were against most things, most philosophies, most religions, most sorts of uh, stately homes, most reasons why people do things they saw as phony, uh, but they hadn't just come through the first world, first world War, I think. Or were they just building up to it? Anyway, this is called Gorp Spen. And the idea of poems like this is that um, rather than putting symbols in the form of words in your mind, and you then, if I say elephant, you think of an elephant. If I say dog, you think of a dog. If I say something sexual, I think of something sexual. And you have no freedom as long as your intellect is tied in with all those images. So they want you to get and forget meaning. And this is a sort of Dardoist poem. But it's got an odd bit in the middle. Gorp, spen, solfion, telbo, sponteg, tog, zub, stetchel, zoma, patrod, lint, fobo, lip, flut, wut, zum, flip, tak, pin, tobo, sosh, flip, nip, sap, tea. I have bought a cheap motorcycle jacket. Nep, sub, bez, tape, stas, leggies, duf, zzz, norden, plateau, sword, zip, fip, cord, spals, or tooth, noddle, split, zorten. Ringe, Zort, Manfelbo, Tanat, Torge, Nod, Nod, Nodden, Telfo, Telfo. So that was a few moments of freedom. Uh, this next poem I performed at City Varieties. I was on the same stage as Steve Coogan, <coughs> Linda Smith and all these people. And Linda Smith laughed at my wig and uh, costume and um, said how ridiculous. Uh, but I've got the last laugh because she's dead now. <laughs> and, um, but nothing to do with me. But I remember when I read this poem, there was a guy in the uh, front row, near the front, and he was trying to climb over the seats, uh, completely uh, enraged, uh, wanted to get out and try and kill me, he was trying to climb over and get on the stage, and his wife was pulling him back by his jacket, saying, no, no, Derek, or whatever. And um, then he came looking for me in the dressing rooms, but by then I'd gone to the bar, uh, and then he came looking for me in the bar, ostensibly to get my autograph, but uh, I think he was lying. But I changed out of all this stuff and he couldn't find me. And uh, so I escaped uh, a thorough beating. And this poem is called Goldfish. Goldfish, you go round and round in a tank without any mates, with your mouth open. A bit like being in the army. And it was all hard for him because everybody in the place was laughing apart from him. And I think he just felt a little bit sort of annoyed. <laughs> but I was paying his wages, so, you know, shouldn't get too uppity. Um, and this is uh, about sentiment. It's called Gerbil. Little Gerbil in the shop, I hope you find a home. 
We made friends just yesterday, and so I wrote this poem. Little gerbil in the shop, you can dance, you can hop, you have lots of furry mates, but if there's too many, they get fed to the snakes. <laughs> And that's one reason why there are lots of gerbils and mice in pet shops. They use them as food for the other animals. It saves a bit of money. Little tip there if you're thinking about being in a pet shop. <laughs> uh, this is called Getting Older. It's um, okay for you youngsters. Finding love might be difficult, but wait uh, till you're 50 and see what it's like then. Or 60. But people still need love as they get older. And um, this is called getting older. Fruit bowl on the sideboard. You often offer up your contents, even though they are dried and shriveled. <laughs> but um, you mustn't let yourself get too shriveled, of course. But there's always self-love. <laughs> This is Garden Invaders. I went to the garden centre. I said, could you redesign my garden? I live in a semi-detached on the ring road. The man said, do you want decking? <laughs> <laughs> I thought, that's no way to run a garden design business. <laughs> and this is about um, those over curious application forms and interview sessions that you go through when you try and get a, a job that uh, you don't get your hands too dirty out and they have interviews now that last about three days and you have to build a, a raft out of oil drums and bits of wood and then um, so this is uh, Jeff and he's 27 years old Jeff that's pretty old for a mop it says here on your CV that you used to be a cleansing officer are you sure about that? It also says that you live in Alwoodley. I've been told that you live on a workshop in Beeston. A worktop. What have you got to say about that? Well, you worked as a red coat at Butlins for two years. I find that hard to believe. It says here you were in a tribute band, a personating share. Have you got any photos? I've got a few questions about your opinions. What's your opinion of the war in Iraq? Do you think they'll ever surrender? And what about these new identity cards? Are they good value at 80 pounds? What about hunting? Should we hunt foxes, single parents, members of the royal family, or asylum seekers? Which would you choose? What about capital punishment? Should it be used outside of London? <laughs> And these poems are usually um, performed in pubs, but not always. And um, it can get a bit riotous, which you'll see if you buy the DVD. I'm going to end soon, because I think you've sat very quietly, very, very well. But I'd like to find a good one that's not too rude. <laughs> It's one about death, because the older you get, the more time you spend thinking about it. And um, when you get to the point where, if, if your life is an hourglass, it's not full at the top anymore, with just a few in the bottom. There's lots in the bottom and just a few in the top. And you start to wonder, what's going to happen to me when the last grain of sand drops through and somehow I'm no longer qualified to be walking about on the planet? And we're all going to find out. It could be fantastic. It might be absolutely nothing, in which case you'll never remember that you were here and you won't remember that Earth existed or that life existed. You'll just be a complete blank, a bit like when you're asleep. And we do that every day, so maybe it's not going to be too bad. Anyway, this one's about our dog that got run over. And um, I sort of believed in the spirit world and reincarnation and things at the time and I just thought, it's gone to heaven. Why worry? You know, what's the problem? And um, you know, if we're all going to Jesus uh, or Allah, then we've no worries ever really. And if God is eternally merciful, then infinitely merciful, then whatever we do, we'll still sort of get a foothold into heaven. Because um, mercy that's infinite goes on forever and forgives all sins. 
but that's not an excuse for being nasty. So this is called In Memoriam, and it's about our dog that got run over. Our dog's been run over. What do we do with the body? Dig a hole in the garden. And there's some tins of dog food in the cupboard that will have to be disposed of, and a few bags of those biscuits. Our dog's been run over. There's nothing round to stroke. His lead is hanging in the hall. It's probably worth getting another one. We've got all the stuff for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's it from me. We've got books for sale, DVDs. I used to do video or cover things. It is good fun, right? But he's so um, helpful. Yeah, he's Yeah, you're looking at telling the story. Oh, you've got a good crowd. Yeah. 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 Yeah.